Hi everyone, this is Christine So from Global Health Council. We're going to be getting started with our webinar. Today's topic is um, looking at measurement and accountability for global health in the context of the World Health Assembly that's coming up. We have two great speakers, Lola Dare from Chestrad and Carolyn Barrett from UNF who will be sharing information with us, so we're looking forward to hearing from them. Um, Global Health Council is a membership organization. Most of you probably know us already, um, and many of you hopefully are on our delegation to the upcoming WHA. Um, so we are looking forward to seeing you all there. We will be having a um, webinar next week on orientation to the WHA, which we encourage all of our delegates to attend. Um, today's uh, presentation is one in the series of what we call the Scrum events, um, which give us an opportunity to look at the policy issues that will be discussed at the WHA, make sure that everybody is really up to speed on what uh, the issues are and what's being decided, and also to have a chance to talk about advocacy um, strategies around any of these particular issues. Um, we are I think actually at the last of our Scrum series, um, and so we are looking forward now to being together in Geneva. Um, just to mention that GHC will have a master calendar of all the WHA events um, available to delegates and on our website. Um, this will be real time, so it will be updated as we get additional information. If you or any of your organizations are involved in events that you would like us to include on the calendar, please send them to Liz Colway. Um, we will also be publicizing the various events that GHC is supporting at WHA, so that will be coming out soon. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, turn over the mic to Liz Colway, who is GHC's Member Engagement uh, Manager, and she will go through the logistics um, around the webinar, and um, then we will hear from our speakers. So Liz, over to you. Great. Thank you, Christine. Um, so like Christine mentioned, we have two speakers uh, this afternoon. Um, so we will go through both of their presentations, and then we'll be taking a Q&A at the end. Um, there is a question box at the bottom of your GoToWebinar uh, 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 remote control panel, and you uh, can feel free to type your question in there. Uh, we ask that you state your name and organization um, when asking the question so that we can um, bring it up to our panelists. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand the mic over now to Carolyn Barrett. Um, like Christine mentioned, she's with UNF, and she leads their global health policy uh, for SDG monitoring and implementation. She has uh, led several multi-stakeholder working groups over the past three years related to SDG agreement and has been in close dialogues along with other partners with the WHO Secretariat about health uh, measurement. So welcome, Caroline. Great, thank you. Um, Liz, just want to make sure that you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so I've been asked to talk about um, SDG monitoring and measurement at the World Health Assembly this year. It seems like each year there's more at stake at WHA than at last year's WHA, and this year is no exception. So thank you so much um, to Christine and the team at GHC for putting together these policy scrums. Um, I want to start on my first slide first with just a big picture reminder um, of what all is at stake here and at, a, at a very high level. So on August 2nd, I'm sure everyone remembers that the SDG agenda was formally agreed to at ANGA in September, um, but the text itself um, was agreed to about six weeks earlier on a Sunday in August, so you can be forgiven if you weren't tuned into to UN TV or in person in New York at that time. Um, but that was when the, the language was officially um, agreed to. And the room there, and, and it was transmitted live over webinar, was just so hopeful and full of optimism that you know, if you believe in, in multilateralism and cooperative solutions to development, it was just a really wonderful day. And I think the challenge now, um, over the next 15 years, is going to be to maintain that momentum and the shared sense of ownership over this agenda, um, and especially over the near term as we work through some issues, um, both technical 
and more political and controversial, like you know, accountability. Um, so that's just a bit of context. So specifically, around WHA this year, and we can move on to the next slide, there is um, a resolution. It's called Health in the 2030 Agenda. And this resolution is being proposed by Japan, Panama, South Africa, Thailand, US, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Um, right now, the draft is still at a pretty high level. Um, like all resolutions, there's a section that urges member states to do a set of things, and then a section that requests the, w the Director General of WHO to do a set of things. And so fundamentally, the first you know, piece of content in the resolution urges member states to, quote, scale up comprehensive action at the national, regional, and global levels to achieve the goals and targets of the 2030 Agenda related to health by 2030. And then there's several other sections, mostly geared towards around member states, uh, urging member states to develop processes for monitoring progress towards the goal and targets. And then it requests the Director General to ensure that WHO is capacitated to support national plans and to support member states to strengthen statistical health and information systems capacities. So what does all that mean and what's really at stake and what might be in the resolution, what might be left out of the resolution? Um, we can move on to the next slide to dive a little bit deeper. So the issues at play around this resolution first are related to the Sustainable Development Goal Indicators. So I imagine that everyone is aware um, that there's a process, a UN process going on right now to finalize the formal SDG indicators. So there's a list of about 230 indicators that was agreed as a practical starting point in March at the UN Statistical Commission. And so over the past year, there's been a, a, a year-long process led by a subset of member states called the Interagency um, Expert Group on SDGs. And that group put forward a proposal in March to the full UN Statistical Commission body of these 230 indicators. And so the, the indicators were formally agreed to in principle in March as a way to sort of maintain momentum, but with the recognition that there are some technical issues that would need to be worked through over the course of the next year. And so that member state body, the IAEG, its mandate was extended to sort of continue this technical work. Now as it relates to health, there's, I think, general agreement um, that many of the health, health indicators are in good shape. The exception is around the universal health coverage indicators. So there's two indicators. One relates to coverage of health services. And that's going to be based on a composite or tracer set of indicators. Um, so a composite of you know, reproductive health indicators, malaria coverage indicators, ART, there's some NCD indicator, indicators. I think there's 16 mentioned in total. And there's a process underway to come up with a one composite measure of all of the 16 indicators. And that's raised a lot of questions around what, what um, interventions in particular will be included in that tracer set, what that composite indicator will look like in practice, how useful will it be for cross-country comparisons, et cetera. And so WHO and the World Bank are leading on the process to develop that composite indicator. And that's definitely a space to watch. The second UHC indicator is um, related to financial risk protection. And so there was a last minute revision just before the March agreement that changed the, the financial risk protection language completely um, to the now reads number of people covered by health insurance or public health system for 1,000 population. And that's a significantly weaker formulation and it no longer really measures financial risk protection and whether to what extent are or aren't driven into poverty by accessing services. So this set of issues, the two indicators around UHC, there's a very concerted effort to figure out if, um, and, and especially led by some civil society actors, to figure out if this can be referenced um, in the overall health in the 2030 agenda resolution. Um, and if, if folks are interested in plugging into those particular advocacy efforts or learning more, I'm happy to connect you to the people who are leading that, that effort. Um, second is the Health Data Collaborative. 
So this is a new partnership, um, relatively new, it was launched in March, uh, led by WHO, USAID, the World Bank and UNICEF, uh, to strengthen and harmonize investments in country health data systems. So there's a recognition that in many countries in the South, there's a lack of capacity um, to really collect, use, analyze, communicate um, health data. And obviously that has huge implications on how we're going to be um, measuring progress on the health SDGs and how we're going to know if we're achieving our goals. Um, that is currently mentioned in the resolution. Um, and so that's a, a space to watch, um, not because it will necessarily be controversial at WHA. It's expected that there will be you know, a sentence in the resolution that references its importance and the, the importance of investing in country capacities. But rather, it's a space to watch because I think there'll be a lot of movement as the collaborative gets off the ground, brings in more partners, finalizes its country engagement strategy. Um, and I think that's it's an initiative where everyone, all stakeholders, really have the potential to, to play an important role. Third is the launch and endorsement of the Global Strategy for Women's, Children's, and Adolescents' Health and the new operational framework. So that actually is likely to be a separate, standalone resolution or agenda item, um, but still important in the context of, of this discussion about um, health monitoring, because included in the operational framework is a specific monitoring framework, which has its own set of indicators that are aligned with, but go beyond the SDG indicators. So there are 15 core RMNCAH indicators and a longer list of 60 related indicators that are in included in this operational framework that's expected to be endorsed. There's still some ongoing work around the monitoring framework for the Every Woman, Every Child movement and the global strategy, particularly around how we measure progress for people living in humanitarian settings and how to measure whether all of the right resources and enough resources are being mobilized by the right sets of stakeholders and are being used efficiently. Um, but for all intents and purposes, Oops, sorry, I just saw a note that I'm, being, I'm a bit muffled. I'll hold my microphone a bit closer. Um, hopefully you can hear me a bit better. For all intents and purposes, um, that the monitoring framework and the operational framework will be um, agreed to at WHA, um, and it's, a, it's another space to watch um, in, the, in the months following. And then finally, and this is perhaps the, the, the hottest topic of all, is how the, the World Health Assembly and the member states engage in the overall SDG monitoring process. And so a few things here. First, we know that WHO will be the agency responsible, um, or an agency responsible, for measuring progress towards SDG 3, the health SDG. So they'll be issuing an annual report, which will have a I've heard various things here, but some percentage of the report will be focused explicitly on UHC measurement, and then the rest of the report will be focused on the rest of SDG 3, as well as the linkages for health across all 17 goals, and identifying how we're doing at you know, bringing a more of a cross-sectoral approach and recognizing that health is both a driver of and an outcome of progress on all 17 goals. The first of those reports will be released at this WHA. Second, there's this idea of a, a peer review process where, and this is something that the Secretariat has proposed and I think I think might be a bit controversial um, in the in the resolution negotiations, and it's not clear if this is going to be agreed. Um, but but perhaps there might be room for some sort of peer review at the regional level, ministry to ministry, on SDG three progress. And then finally, I think the the big overarching question about all of this is how the World Health Assembly and the health community docks into the high level political forum. And so the high-level political forum, some of you may know, is the official UN member state platform for tracking and reviewing progress across the SDG agenda. Um, and it's meant to, to highlight and communicate gaps, mobilize more political will in certain areas as needed. Um, and then there's a, there's a, a 
quite detailed process and schedule for how countries on a rotational basis can volunteer um, for assessments of their own progress. And so this year, um, in July 2016, in New York, is the first HLPF meeting um, of the SDG era. It will be, I think, July 11th through 20th, and then there's two of those days will be a specific ministerial portion. And the theme this year, there will be a, a different theme every year, um, and the theme this year is Leave No One Behind. And so that refers to the the core um, MDG poverty alleviation agenda. Um, how do we finish the job for those most vulnerable? Um, and so I think there's nice there's a, a nice tie-in um, to some of our core uh, women's and children's health and infectious disease health issues to this theme. Um, officially, every year the HLPF will rotate. Um, Different, different goals, and so the official SDG 3 goal review is not for another few years. Um, and so I think the, the, the idea in theory is that every year the Assembly would, the World Health Assembly would produce something that's then fed into the July meeting of the high-level political forum. And I think the mechanisms for that hopefully will be clarified in this resolution um, and clarified at WHA this year. Um, let's see, I think, I think I can stop there. I want to make sure that Lola has enough time to speak and that we then have enough time um, for discussion. Um, so my last slide is just uh, my email address um, and also the email address of my colleague Kate Dotson, who is also an excellent point of contact going forward. And then I wanted to mention that the UN Foundation, our New York Policy Office, sends around monthly updates of um, you know, the, the insider, an insider's view of what's going on in the UN, process reviews, updates on how stakeholders can get engaged. Um, and so if you'd like to sign up for that monthly email list, um, do email my colleague Courtney and her email address is there. Um, and then our, our Twitter handle is there as well. Um, so that's all for now. Happy to hand it back over uh, to you, Liz. Great. Thank you so much, Caroline, for the very thorough presentation. Um, so we did receive a few questions, but I'm going to just hold them until the end, and I'm going to go now on to uh, Lola Dare. Um, so Lola is the Chief Executive Officer and Secretary of the Governing Council of Chesterad. Uh, Dr. Dare is a community physician and epidemiologist. Um, she also facilitates health leadership development and management programs and serves as a consultant for many regional and organizations in public health and social development. Uh, Lola is... Uh, working at local, national, and regional levels to advocate for and support the increased application of management and business, and business tools to improve the performance of African health and social development systems. Um, so I'm going to hand over the mic to you, Lola. Hello? OK. I don't know if you can hear me. Um, good evening. Yes, um, can, you. can you? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm not going to re thank you first for having me for this policy scrum. I'm not going to repeat very much of the valuable information that uh, Caroline has shared from the UNF. We're working together very closely with the UNF on the data collaborative. But I'm just going to highlight some of the issues in the data collaborative and what it is for us going forward. Um, the data collaborative has grown out of the measurement summit. And I hope that we're all the, the participants are going to have and will have access to this call to action, which looks at the how the call to action from the measurement summit, the five points, have actually informed the work of the collaborative and the structure, the technical working groups, as well as this engagement across different stakeholders. Originally led by the World Bank, USAID, and WHO. The Health Data Collaborative in itself now has expanded to include a variety of um, partners. Um, there's a website for the collaborative, www.healthdatacollaborative.org, where the list of commitment from partners and um, other stakeholders, you, you will find them there. Um, what the collaborative achieves to do, first it takes forward the five-point agenda and call to action on measurement and accountability. And the next slide shows you this five-point agenda and the five broad areas of 
that the, of, of um, where what the data collaborative aims to achieve a common standards and effective tools enhance technical co collaboration and to monitor progress and accountability and civil society has been very engaged in this process from the summit and um, Chestrad working in collaboration with UNF Global Health South and the Global Health Council did ensure that there was well significant local and global representation at the measurement summit and the statement was issued by issued at the summit followed by accompanied by a technical brief we have followed that up collectively and have engaged in the, the, the collaborative to ensure that we keep accountability and data use on the boner the collaborative is arranged the next slide please into five main working groups Country action and regional collaboration, facility and community data, population data sources, health systems monitoring, data analytics use, and open access. The uniqueness of it is that this, there are also subgroups, ensuring that a broad variety of actions are recognized. A civil society is largely included in the country, a country action and regional collaboration sub, subgroup, and um, African Statistical Symposia, um, along with Chestra, that are coordinating the work in Africa, while the Asian e-information network is working across Southeast Asia. The, the beauty of that also is that we're cross-pollinating ideas and, and strategies between um, the networks that are part of, of the civil society platform of the collaborative, and I will be engaged, I would be I would be showing that to you on a more detailed slide. The others, the, the on the on the left side of the slide, you would see the different um, initiatives and and issues that the global collaborative seeks to address. The global collaborative by the World Health Assembly, like Caroline has said, has no standalone resolution, but its resolution is integrated into the resolution on sustainable development goals. It, uh, um, but the, the key thing about the collaborative is its endorsement by global health leaders and there is a meeting of global health leaders around the World Health Assembly to endorse the working groups, to endorse the strategies and also to take things forward within the context of that. There's close collaboration and engagement of the Health Data Collaborative with the Statistical Commission which by itself links it to the MDG, SDG review and monitoring process. What are the key considerations? Um, for us in civil society, um, the key consideration remains the need to balance the technical and the political debate and to ensure that accountability and data use remain at the core of the actions that, that the collaborative take forward. It's increasingly so, and I'm actually at a meeting of, with the collaborative here, working to ensure that civil society action and accountable action is integrated and remains for into the collaborative and um, providing a greater base of data utilization for accountability and going beyond accountability to policy programming and um, the core the raison depth of the collaborative is about alignment and harmonization at the country level and, and I dare say also at the global level and so we need to continue to work on development partner processes development partner behavior and towards alignment and promoting the political will for, for that alignment. The key issues of capacity. Um, there are many, uh, for want of wanting to be to sound like a broken record, we have over many years talked about the technical one, investing in data, investing in data quality, and there are new capacities to be looked at when we begin to talk about accountability and country engagement systems. And these capacities are, are at all levels, regional, global, and country. So what kind of new capacities do we need at the global level? What kind of new capacities do we need to ensure that health as health and health as is in its multi-sector social determinants capacity is also reflected in the work of the collaborative? Um, I have this rather long list of CS platforms and processes. Um, one of the key things we're trying to do is to ensure that there is cross collaboration and cross linkages across the various CS platforms um, and, and the different accountability platforms that impact on health, including the high level political forum. 
But the health sector is known for its many different platforms. So even civil society alignment across the GFF, the PMNCH, UHC Alliance, PHCPI, which is the Primary Healthcare Performance Initiative, and uh, plus many others is very critical. Th th those are the things we debate and see how we need to put that into the collaborative. And then, of course, integrating citizens' engagement into subnational and national accountability platforms and processes remains a key consideration. Um, next slide, please. H how can you engage? Sorry, Lola, I think we lost you. Uh, are you there? Lola, it looks like you have gone onto mute. Can you unmute yourself? Did I do that? Can you hear me now? We've got you back, yes, thank you. Okay, I, I don't know where you lost me, but looking at the slide on GHC, and actually saying that it's really not about engagement of the GHC because we've, GHC has been really a part of this from the beginning. And I must really thank um, the, the Secretariat and leadership of the GHC for, this, for the kind of collaborative um, support we've had and also from the UNF. Um, so we need to continue to keep data use and accountability at the core of the data collaborative and keeping alignment at the core of the data collaborative through our various activities independently in our organizations and collectively in the CS, CS, data, CS platform of the collaborative. Um, we, I, can, I also indicate that collaboration and engagement with the Chesra JT has been long-standing. We worked well on the civil society participation and the statement of the summit, the technical brief of the summit, the technical brief released at UNGA, and the participation in the evolution of the platform. The key thing we invite all GHC members to do is to join the CS collaborative. Um, and CS platform of the collaborative. There is a lot of work to be done across all of those subgroups, and uh, it's a north-south subgroup. We have um, we have worked well with the secretariat of the collaborative to ensure that there is civil society in every working group, two north northern and one southern. So if you are interested in joining the collaborative, please send an email to Samuel Dare at chester.ngo.org, and he would invite you to the CSTC website and also to the work, uh, work drop box that includes all the documents that we have so far. It's very important as you join to identify a working group to, to be a part of. A maximum of three so that you can be engaged in, you can be engaged in and that, that includes that list and be active in the CS community of practice in each of those working groups. We are working with the, the leadership to also continually identify the comparative advantage of the Global Health Council as a global partner and amplifier of country voices. Um, we're looking at support through strategic webinars such as this to continue to share what each of those working groups and, and sub-working groups are doing um, so that we can continue to share it with the GHC community to engage in the development of best practice papers, toolkits, and guidance notes, both for CS and community engagement, and to provide opportunities and platforms for USG and broader institutional advocacy for CS engagement in the action plan. I, I, I don't know if I should stop here, or I should go on to, to actually look at civil society in the data collaborative, and uh, what, are, what are the key things that we would be engaged in and we have uh, the, the Secretariat and the core team of the CS platform have agreed to work on within the collaborative or you would like me to stop now and take questions? Um, I think it would be fine if you just continue on and um, we can still start taking questions now and then by the time you're done we'll have a few to ask our, um, you and both uh, your and Caroline. Okay, the CS collaborative, the CS platform really looked at this key question, towards impactful accountability. How do we balance the political and the technical imperatives? From the work we jointly published with the Global Health Council Secretariat, it was very clear that the technical process, goals, targets, measurements, indicators, 
seem to overweigh and imbalance accountability towards supply and less of demand. It does not take away from the importance of the supply side, the need to improve data quality, the need to improve on indicators and measurement, but it also means that accountability is not is not as loud as it should be without that demand side, which is the political process, data utilization, action, remedial, dialogue, reward, incentive systems, sanctions and whistleblowing as um, as um, as as much as that is resisted, it's also an important part of accountability. Working together, we involved, evolved a civil society engagement process in measurement and accountability that draws from the global agreed processes of monitor, review, and account and act. Um, for much of the monitoring activities, we have mandated institutions like WHO, PEPFAR, uh, UN, UNICEF, UN. Have been mandated to engage in country to lead country action. We identify an engagement role for civil society to review, which includes data systems and quality, open data initiatives, etc. It's not. It, it's a place where both the mandated institutions and civil society can collaborate. And in those in, in those areas, we have evolved a strategy of contributing and been very active in that area. Then there is this special area of action, that is the political process, which includes promoting political will for alignment and coordination, working on targeted campaigns including CRVS, health and accountability dialogues, scorecards, partnership behaviors, peer accountability and accountability demand. It's the traditional purview of civil society, and that's what the civil society, the civil society platform seeks to engage in. The next slide. We have five civil society, we have five working group objectives. Um, advocacy for aligned investments, one country m and &E, data utilization, accountability, and the application of technology that supports the global data revolution and SDG reporting. The implementation of an Africa-wide advocacy program on civil registration and vital statistics. The development of integrated scorecards, there's so many indicators, and today we are still struggling to stop or to reduce the plethora of indicators at the country level. It is very clear that especially at the country level, civil society is not going to be able to cope with the number of indicators that are going to hit country level. And so we're working with the partners to look at an integrated, simplified, cross-partner scorecard or, or data process that is easy for civil society to use in its function. We've identified key information gaps from the two papers and publications with GHC and from the review of the processes of the global of the Health Data Collaborative, which they think that we, we all think that is the purview of civil society to, to, to bridge. Measuring civil society participation, identifying best practices, and also resourcing mechanisms for sustainably resourcing civil society participation. And then the fifth objective is to ensure broad civil society contribution of their collective expertise to the data collaborative. The next slide shows you where civil society is placed in the data collaborative. And that shows you where Chestrad is placed. We have been, and, and, and the other two, two organizations are also included there. Um, I want to spend a bit of time on the next slide because it shows you the governance arrangement or institutional arrangement, because I think governance is, is a bit strong, the institutional arrangement around civil society in the collaborative. We are the base and hosts and conveners of the civil society, but we have established a small core team of 10 northern, 10 southern and 5 northern. This core team is also supported by a community of, by two, by focal points in each of the working groups, two northern and two southern. Then every other civil society organization that indicates interest in the working group is organized into a community of practice to support that system. And out there you see the different networks and organizations where we have attracted membership into the civil society platform, which stands today at 72 organizations. And this next slide, um, I won't bother to read just describes what each of those layers are doing and how they are integrating and relating to each, to each other. Um, it allows us to have a big, a big relevant group and active participation into the, into, the, into the collaborative to keep the civil society 
at gender on. This last slide shows you what we expect success to look like. The current state in 2015 is a huge investment in technical, in the technical merits of, the, of, of measurement and performance, goals, indicators, targets, and a, a, a probably, a, well not probably, certainly insignificant investment at global and country level in remedial action, citizens' engagement and demand, and those political actions that take techniques that must align with the technical process and make accountability meaningful. Our goal is to ensure that by 2030, both the technical and political process are well resourced, accountability is meaningful, and it is honest. And at the bottom, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an increasing balance of moving from uh, 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 the development partners from a sole attributory process to a contributory process that in encourages the political world towards alignment and um, and coordination. Um, th 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 that's really it from the data collaborative and how we we would be discussing much of this at the, gen at the World Health Assembly through in each of the sessions that data is mentioned. We would be working with the Secretariat to ensure that ministers are also engaged, civil society are also engaged, and I'm sure that if there's any other development other than that, um, the GHC would be central to planning and organizing that, but we're still discussing that with the, with the Secretariat. Um, if you do require additional information, Samuel is the best person to send an email to, and his email is included in the set of slides. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Lola. Um, so at this time, we are accepting questions. Um, so just a reminder, if you want to type in your question um, in the questions box on your GoToWebinar uh, platform, um, we can take them now. Um, and we do have our first question um, actually directed towards uh, Caroline. Um, and that should be di uh, displayed on your screen now. Um, so the question is, what are the politics behind the change in the indicator related to the financial risk? Um, the easy-to-measure argument provided was not convincing to a large number of health activists and academics. Thanks, that's a great question. Um, two things here. One is that I think it's important to note that for many countries who are members of the IAEG, so that, that member state body that was, that was making these changes and was, was tasked with creating the indicator list, um, for many member states, the actual person that, that represents the country in the IAEG is not a technical statistician um, or a, a health measurement expert. And so the original language for the, the financing indicator mentioned something that's known as catastrophic health expenditures. That has a, the term catastrophic, as, as some of you may be aware, has a very particular definition, very particular technical definition um, in in health financing. But if you're not a health financing person, I think that that term was a bit inflammatory and wasn't properly understood. Um, and my understanding is that this, these discussions were happening very quickly um, in one of the meetings um, without perhaps all of the consultations with technical experts that we might hope would happen. And so there was a desire among some member states to, to revise the indicator to change that term. And then at the same time, there was a group of member states, um, particularly the, the African delegation, but I think there are some others as well, um, that raised the idea of public health, um, public insurance systems, because these countries um, have strong or growing um, insurance systems, and they wanted, like, that That was a familiar context to them for financial risk protection, and they wanted to perhaps, you know, use themselves as a case study and highlight their own positive experience um, in, in expanding access through their own public health um, insurance system. Um, and so that's where the addition of the insurance language came in. Um, and then at the same time, I think there was a there was a, um, a compromise then um, by by that was suggested I think by the Germans that then suggested adding um, the the health insurance language as well. So I'm sorry. So the the original 
proposal by the African group was to say number of people covered by a public health system. And then as a compromise, I think it was the German delegation and maybe a few others that suggested also adding in health insurance um, to try to be a bit, a bit more measurable and a bit more um, acceptable. So that's my understanding of the, the evolution. And I think this all happened again in the course of one meeting. <laughs> Uh, this is Lola. In addition to to what Carolina said, um, UHC has also largely been understood and implemented as health insurance at the country level. And so in, in our engagement with countries on even trying to change the financial risk protection, there remains a bit of confusion on what exactly is the global community trying to measure. Because the understanding at country level and the investment at country level of UHC as insurance, especially in Africa, is very significant. And so we've been working with, the, with that same coalition to also integrate that UHC advocacy into the work of the CS Data Collaborative and to ensure that if we don't get any change of that indicator in, in ECOSOC, we are also able to continue to put the pressure on because the statistical committee is, is also um, probably not going to refine it or change it before before it goes to ECOSOC, nobody knows. But it, it, the door is not closed even after the ECOSOC process. So it might just take a bit longer, but I think we need to refine the communication and to, to be clear at country level that UHC is not insurance. At this moment, it's not clear. Great, thank you both. Um, so another question came in, uh, again directed towards Caroline. Um, can you elaborate on the peer review process you mentioned as a tool for the WHA to monitor um, the SDGs or WHA? It's a good question. Unfortunately, I can't. Um, I think I haven't seen anything formally in writing on this. This is something that's been mentioned by some members of the WHO Secretariat as one idea. Um, I am happy to share the draft resolution language, um, which sort of alludes to this, but not in any in the, the type of detail that I, I think we would all um, like to see. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and we also had a question just regarding the meetings that you mentioned in July that we're going to go on. Can you um, either share where um, one could find that information, or if you could repeat the dates again, that would be great. Sure. Um, so a link for folks to take down is sustainabledevelopment.un.org slash HLPF. And that's the website for the High Level Political Forum. There's a lot of really good resources there. Um, again, the dates of the HLPF July meeting are um, July 11th through 20th in New York, and the ministerial days are July 18th through 20th. The stakeholder engagement for that meeting is through the major group structure um, that was used during the open working group process. I'm sorry for all of these acronyms <laughs> in the UN speak. Um, but the major group structure is the official mechanism by which non-member state stakeholders can participate in the HLPF and can submit views. Um, the, the, for the health community, there is an NGO major group that has a specific health cluster, Marianne Hasselgrave, um, and the NCD Alliance and UNF have all sort of loosely, um, and um, the International HIV AIDS um, Initiative and Mariel Hart have all sort of loosely coordinated this health cluster. Um, I think if folks are interested in either participating in that cluster to be more involved in the HLPF preparations or in taking on some co-leadership of that group, I'm sure it would be welcome. So um, do get in touch with me. Great, thank you. And for those that weren't able to jot down that link, uh, I'll be sending it around along with a set of slides from today's presentation um, and a recording of the webinar. Um, so that will be shared uh, within the next uh, few days with all participants.
So it looks like we don't have any other questions at this time. Um, we still have a few more minutes, so you, uh, feel free to type in your question in the box. Um, and meanwhile, I actually will go on to the next slide and just talk about what's coming up for uh, GHC. Um, so Christine already mentioned a few of these details, uh, but the 69th World Health Assembly will take place um, starting May 22nd and will last all week. Um, GHC is attending and bringing along a delegation. Um, and if you want more information on uh, what GHC is up to at, G, uh, at WHA this year, you can visit uh, www.globalhealth.org slash GHC WHA 69. Um, and there's um, hopefully all the information you need on that website. Um, also, if uh, you or your organization is planning a side event um, at WHA, uh, we welcome you to send it to us at events at globalhealth.org. We'll be um, collecting all kinds of events going on, uh, both official and unofficial events at WHA, and creating a master calendar on our website. Um, and then we also have an opportunity, if you are a GHC member, um, for you to submit statements to GHC, um, which uh, may be presented um, during the World Health Assembly. Um, and our policy can be found also on that same website that I mentioned before. Great. Well, this is Christine. Um, so it looks like we've covered everything for today. Um, Liz, unless there's something I think we can go ahead and close. Um, I want to thank our speakers, and this is really great information, and in particular, I think this is one of these areas where we see a lot coming up at WHA, but as well, a lot of ongoing work um, that will actually be growing over the, the coming months. Um, what's exciting, I think, around this measurement and accountability area is that we do, as we've heard today, have options for engaging with the Health Data Collaborative and the other efforts that are ongoing, which means that both participation in WHA can um, you know, be influential there, but it can also um, guide us in our uh, engagement and activity as we go forward. Um, so thanks again to Lola and Caroline, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody in Geneva. And um, safe travels and see you soon. Thank you very much.